Nobody told me what I was supposed to do, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about me and how I got my various enterprises, if you will, started and things. But I won't, I'm not going to take too long, and I really want to entertain a lot of questions. I, I love Q&A, so if you can feel free to interrupt me while I'm talking, but when we get to the end, I, I promise there'll be, be some uh, time. When I was 10 years old, I got a chemistry set from my uncle, my cousin actually, and he and I made gunpowder and we blew things up and we made invisible ink and from then on I wanted to be a mad scientist. That was just, that was the only thing I ever wanted to do. My dad on the other hand was an entrepreneur and by the time I graduated high school he probably started seven failures. But he was on his eighth and it was a success. He had started a, a pattern shop and foundry. Most of you probably don't know what a pattern shop is, but I think all of you probably know what a foundry is. Uh, and he wanted me to go to college, study metallurgy and come back and be in the foundry business. And no, I didn't see any mad scientist in that. So I went off to school, got a degree in chemistry and I don't know, this, this room is probably not exactly like me. Um, I hated English and history and all the liberal arts stuff when I was in high school. I was all about science and the mad science stuff. So I was a chemistry major at the University of Alabama, but if you were a dual major, chemistry and physics, you didn't have to take any English and physics and history at that time. <laughs> so I became a dual major, uh, wound up loving physics, went to graduate school in physics, and if I had that, someone to, to ask me what I am, I think I'm a physicist. Uh, I think like an engineer, but I'm, my background and foundation, if you will, is in physics. Uh, I, in college, the, the Army seduced me with $47 a month to go to advanced ROTC and give up two years of my life. Uh, that wasn't such a good deal. But they added, for another year, they sent me to flight school, and that was a pretty good deal. So I... Uh, did go to, went to flight school, went to Vietnam, served a, a year there, and while I was there flying, um, my dad wrote a letter and said, they're moving the foundry, they're building an interstate, 565, where the foundry was, and he was gonna either close it uh, when they acquired the land or rebuild on the south end of the parkway if any of us, I have four, three brothers, four boys. If any of the boys want to join him in the foundry business, he's going to buy this land down on Green Cove Road. I was kind of homesick. I, you know, you, you just, every day you're not quite sure you're going to wake up the next day. And so I, I said, yeah, I'll come. And one of my other brothers agreed. And so we joined dad in a company called Hudson Metals down on Green Cove Road in 1970. And it was a gray iron. It, it was an aluminum foundry at the time, but my brother and I converted it into a gray iron aluminum foundry, one of the most automated uh, foundries in the southeast. Uh, really a lot of fun, nothing like physics, a lot of hard work. Um, but during that period, I, I did fall in love with uh, both, both business, and that during that period is when you might remember, you may have heard about, I don't know, there's people here old enough to remember. Um, Poplar, Poplar Electronics had a little ad that said, Buy, build your own computer, $389, I think it was. And it was the very first home computer, and you had to sorter the whole thing, a million sorter joints. Anyhow, I wrote my check, I built a computer, I wrote software to run the payroll and the accounting system for the foundry. So I got really interested in in computers at that point. But at the same time, Boyer and Coyne, two people at Stanford, figured out how to cut DNA and splice DNA. Take it out of one organism, put it in another organism, take it, move it around. And I just, to me, that was the physics of life and that's what I wanted to do. So dad and I had been in the foundry business for about 12 years and he was thinking about retiring and I encouraged that. And, uh, <laughs> We sold the foundry, thank goodness, because as you know, all founders are pretty much closed now. Uh, we sold it to a group uh, out of Pennsylvania, and I took the money and went back to UAH and got a degree in biology. I'd never taken a biology class. So here I'm 41 years old, and 
I love going to school with all these young people. They keep you feeling young. But anyway, uh, I went to study biology to learn how to be a genetic engineer, but I also love the business aspect and the comp computational aspect. So I was looking in graduate school for an opportunity uh, to start a company. And while I was doing my graduate work, I, was see I isolated and sequenced the myosin heavy chain genes, which are the muscle genes from a cow. That was an experience I could tell you about because I had to go down to Auburn and cut muscles out of cows. That wasn't fun. Mm -hmm. um, anyhow, to do, those, to do that sequencing, I would order a piece of synthetically made DNA from a company in California, and they would ship it. I would order it today. I'd get it in about a month. And then I could sequence that DNA about 100 bases. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, we might talk about that later. But yeah, I'd sequence about 100 bases and design a new piece of synthetic DNA off of this last piece that I'd figured out and order it, wait another month. Well, I had 13 genes I was doing, so it wasn't like I was standing still, but it was still a very slow process. While I was in my third year in graduate school, just after my second year, I guess, a lady came by wanting to sell us a DNA synthesizer. And she sat it down on a table, it wasn't very big, and she made me these synthetic oligos in four hours. And I said, what the hell, I'm waiting a month. <laughs> you know, I couldn't afford the machine, or the university couldn't afford the machine. Um, but I called up my supplier, Synthetic Genetics, in, uh, in California, and I said, why, why does it take a month? And he says, well, I just have the one machine. And you had kind of wait in the queue. Well, I went out, bought six machines, and ran an ad in the back of science that said, custom-made DNA delivered in 48 hours. <laughs> Boom. And instantly, I owned the world market in synthetic DNA. <laughs> That's a little bitty market, but I, don't, but I was the largest in, in that particular field. And as every one of you, I'm sure, has experienced, everything's about timing. So I started this company in 1987, making synthetic DNA for a market that was maybe $50 million, and I'm down in the $500,000 range of that. Um, and then an invention came along, or was adopted by everybody, called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. Some of you may have heard that. And Every time you do that, you need two little synthetic pieces of DNA. Now the demand for these little oligos that I was making went from you know, a few thousand a year to a million a year, and my company just exploded. So I was just in the right place at the right time. I, I'd also have to give FedEx credit, because <laughs> at, <laughs> yeah, at, you know, 86, 80, I guess FedEx is certain 84, I'm not sure. But anyway, it just become popular or possible to ship overnight. So the idea that I could get an order in the morning, sh ship it the next morning, and it'd be there at 8.30 the following morning because I paid premium uh, for early morning delivery, and it was, I shipped free. These little pieces of DNA were a little bitty tube that you sold for about $500, so I could afford to ship it free. But anyway, it, uh, between FedEx and, and and the invention of PCR. And then uh, I got really rolling and started building a, a service contract for universities around the country who had their own machines but didn't like enjoying them. There was a lot of reasons why it's not a good thing. And so I had a relationship with MIT, the Whitehead Institute there, had just started the Human Genome Project and Research Genetics, my company, became pretty much the dominant supplier of synthetic DNA for the Human Genome Project, and then acquired the intellectual property rights for the genetic markers that when people, s you read in a newspaper somebody found a gene for so-and-so, that's not so common anymore, but in the 90s, every week, somebody was finding a gene for something. Well, every one of those weeks, uh, every one of those genes was found with the markers that Research Genetics sold. So my company just was doing fantastically well. Uh, during that period, um, a gentleman came into my office. Uh, I had a lot of people visit. And I, I just had this fantastic company. I see, I, from a 
company point of view, I don't know how many entrepreneurs there are here. I, I tell this story. When I was in the foundry business, we got to 44 employees, 22 on each shift, and all of a sudden it wasn't fun anymore. You had all these personnel issues and all these people griping at each other. And I that I figured that out in hindsight, let's put it that way. So I started to research genetics and I said, I'm never gonna go over 22 people per shift. Uh, <laughs> so, so I could keep a happy company. It didn't work, but the, uh, <laughs> but I did, I don't know, if you have the chance, if you're running a company that's making money, you can do so many great things for your employees and have so much fun. So research genetics was making lots of money. We, we had lunch every Thursday together with the entire company, which started out as one, my, uh, two actually, my son and myself. Grew to 260, but every Thursday we had lunch that was paid for by Research Genetics. And we all ate together, people brought their kids, their dogs, whatever. And, and it was just a, a great environment. And why I went down that path, I'm not quite sure. Um, getting back onto the story itself, um, people would come in and talk to me and the company was pretty much ran itself. It was, yeah, it's a perfect scenario, gotta say. So this gentleman came in, sat down, said he had heard, of, he wanted to learn about biotechnology that uh, Ed Meehan at UAH had said that I could help him out with that. And so we got to talking and I gave him a book. He came back in a couple of weeks. He had read the book. I, we started having some ideas, sharing some ideas of what you could do with genetic engineering, not what my company was doing. My company was basically a tools company. We sold the tools that researchers needed to, to, do, the, to do the Human Genome Project and all the other research that was going on. But he wanted to do things, you know, solve real issues for humans and things. Uh, we contemplated making a, uh, a, a startup, a, a nonprofit institute to do the kind of health related things that we had in mind or, and also some other things. But I had, this gentleman was, came in, we talked for, I think it was three months before I found out, I mean, his name was Lonnie. That was fine. He was my friend. I found out three months later, his name was Lonnie McMillan. That was okay. Then I found out he was co-founder of Adtran. <laughs> and we're worth more money than you know I could imagine, but he was just this really nice, humble guy that we brainstormed ideas, and so we had we developed this relationship through the 90s, and then my company merged with a company called Invitrogen uh, in Carlsbad, California. At the time of the merger, we were about the same size. We had 260 employees. Uh, Invitrogen had 340. And, but they were publicly traded, and so that, that was kind of attractive. We merged, and all of a sudden I have stock, and I can sell it. You know, I had a really good company, but I didn't have any way to cash in. So having, have, having stock looked attractive, and that was, seemed like a good merger for two years. Uh, that They grew the company here. They invested about $2 million <laughs> in facilities here. And then the bubble burst in, at 2000 around 2000, biotech bubble was a little later than the IT bubble. But they decided uh, they needed to move everything to California and they closed the company, or closed the operations here and moved everybody, or didn't move any people, but moved the jobs uh, to California. So my friend Lonnie and I were sitting around uh, bemoaning this a little bit and he said, well, you remember that a uh, nonprofit institute that we talked about forming, and I said, sure. And he says, well, if, if, if you're willing to make it happen, I'll write a $50 million check. Has <laughs> my life blessed or not? <laughs> so so, so that, that was a pretty good deal. Uh, I, I will say I've been working 15 years without a check. So, uh, but I've been having 50, I've had a wonderful, <coughs> wonderful time. Anyhow, Lonnie uh, did write that check and um, Scott Ludwig at Bradley Arant, who, who was forming the, we were forming the nonprofit uh, papers and he said, you know, if you've really got $50 million in private money and you want to start this nonprofit institute to benefit the state of Alabama, and that was our stated mission, um, 
He said, you should go to the state, see if they'll match it. Can you believe it? They did? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of crazy. We, we, Governor Riley at the time, uh, we, we told him the story. He fell in love with the story. Uh, he did, took a little negotiating and so forth. But anyhow, he did ultimately match Lonnie's 50 million with state's 50 million. Uh, and this building, which you will, you're in, was paid for out of that state's $50 million. And I want to emphasize something here. I don't know if it's anybody in construction, but I get a little bit of pushback when we first opened up. You know, the state gave you $50 million and you built this palace. You know, you, you wasted the taxpayers' money build, building this palace. Well, I want to tell anybody here that understands construction, this, we built this entire building every table, every fitting in here for $223 a square foot. That's about a third of what it would cost to build a building on a university campus or a hospital of the same size or anything like that. So yes, we have what I consider to be just about a palace to operate in, but we built it very, very uh, inexpensively. And I give the credit for that to Mark Smith, the other co-founder of of Adran, because Mark loved buildings, loved architecture. When we asked him to be on the board, he said, I'll be on the board if I can be in charge of the building committee and if I can pick the architect. And we said, well, sure, that's off my list. <laughs> <laughs> and so together, Mark, you know, Mark uh, had a G4 and we flew all over the country looking at other institutes uh, that we wanted to use as examples, modify, uh, to kind of give us inspiration. And uh, we came up with what I think is an incredible design based on all of that. But Mark is the one who made it come in at such a low budget number. Uh, and I can share some of the secrets of how he did that uh, later. Um, let's see, so we formed Hudson Alpha, uh, got the state's money. During the Human Genome Project, I had been, my company had worked with all the, invest, the researchers that were trying to sequence the human genome, one of which was Rick Myers at Stanford, chairman of genetics there, and he and I were pretty close. And I, I formed a scientific advisory board, Hudson Alpha formed a scientific advisory board, and he was one of the members. Uh, and as we would try to, as the SAB board would meet, trying to figure out who we should hire as the director, president of, of the company, Rick kind of got it, infatuated with the job description we were writing and said, you know, I think I want that job. <laughs> so that, it took me a year to actually get him to sign on the bottom line, but uh, he did. And so we were able to recruit, you know, really and truly one of the top three or four people in the nation uh, in the Human Genome Project to be the scientific director here. And I, I, I don't know how we're doing on time, but we got a little, uh, I do want to really have some answers, but I got to plug this. So I'm trying to get Rick, and Rick hasn't, you know, he says, yeah, I really want to do it, Jim, but, you know, I have a wonderful life here in Stanford. My kids are in school here, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he was at Cold Spring Harbor, one of what I consider mecca for molecular biologists, and he was writing a book with Jim Watson on molecular biology there. He's one of the co-authors of the book, and they hired a person to write the chapter on uh, human genetics and Rick called me and he said Jim I, I just met this guy that we've hired to hire to write the chapter on human genetics and we have to have him was I like that word we <laughs> <laughs> so I got his name two weeks later he worked for Hudson Alpha and you know him as Neil Lamb the director of our educational outreach which is by far the most successful single thing we do here we, this last year, we impacted or helped with the education of genetics and genomics with, in the high schools around the state. 77,000 children were touched with our materials and Neil's programs. So Neil has just been a, a wonderful addition here, but that was it. When he said, we need, I, I called Rick up and I said, okay, I got Neil, now I got need you. And uh, he pretty much agreed to come. So anyway, that kind of gets us to the current thing. Let me tell you a little bit about Hudson Alpha if you don't understand it. We, we're truly unique. 
and, and I don't, you know, that's a word that gets overused, but we really are unique. We have 200 people doing nonprofit genomics-based research. We are all about genomics, which basically means we're, you know, we emphasize sequencing of DNA, RNA, to, di to figure out the causes of disease, how to change crops so that you can make uh, salt-tolerant plants that can live in the ocean, things like that. So we do all of that it, from genomics. And it's all nonprofit research supported primarily with NIH grants, DOE grants, foundation grants, and so forth. But we also we are an economic development engine. And we had, when we built, opened this building, five companies that moved in, five biotech companies that, that moved into the building. Uh, and now we have 35 companies here. We have 750 people in that are working for the, 550 people for the companies, is that right? Yeah, 750 total roughly. 550 going on 600 people now that are part of these 35 companies that are in the building. Some are one person with a desk. If you've got a biotech idea and we've got an de empty desk, which, I don't, which we don't right now, $200 a month you can sit here in this beautiful building and try to get your company going. And we, you get a lot of support, obviously. Um, the, but anyhow, the economic development part, uh, which has been fantastically uh, successful as well, and Carter Wells sitting back here. Are you here for the first time, Carter? Okay, so you really come, huh? All right. I didn't know if he came to watch me or what he was coming, but Carter, Carter is in charge of our economic development and does a phenomenal job. Uh, recruiting companies, helping companies, figuring out what companies need to succeed. But I got to remind you, we're just biotech. Um, our, third, our third mission is the education part that I alluded to. We, we, Lonnie and I knew that we needed a workforce if we were going to be successful. And at that point in time, genetics was barely taught in any of the schools. So we have developed curriculum that is now part of the standard the common, not the common core, but the common Alabama requirements for uh, teaching in Alabama that really and truly has, I think we're gonna make Alabama one of the most genetic and genomic literate states in the country. Neil's just doing an amazing job there. Two years ago, we took a bold step and reached out, started translating sequencing and our research into genomic medicine and we opened a, a, the Smith Family Clinic specializing in trying to diagnose kids that are born with undiagnosable diseases. Children that have something wrong with them and all the various standard diagnostic tests don't, don't reveal it. We can sequence that child's genome and a, about 40% of the time figure out what it is. Unfortunately, we, we can't often do a lot to help the person but the family just knowing that this child has this issue, whatever it may be, and it wasn't their fault. It came from the genes, either their own genes that happened, they each carried a, a were a carrier of this rare genetic disease that occurred. Or you'd be amazed more than half the time, we don't think about it, but when you have, a, there's a de novo mutation that happens at fertilization. And so a lot of times this kid has a, a mutation that doesn't appear in either mother or father. And so that means the family is, should be completely safe to have another child. That, that's a big thing too. But the biggest thing is mom knows she didn't drop the kid on her head, didn't feed it the wrong food, <laughs> did not give it its vitamins. It, it's not her fault. And you'd be amazed mothers carry so much guilt when, when their child has an issue. So that's one of the biggest things we can do. So that gets us through our four missions, uh, and I could keep talking about other things, but I really do want to have some uh, quick Q&A, so I'm going to stop. Yes? I think it's no secret that you spliced some new DNA in downtown and into our cultural center, hmm. low mill and stuff like that. I was wondering, how does that help you in your economic development effort? Yeah, so the, the low, low mill, I, I didn't touch on that. I, I guess I didn't think about that when I was telling the story. Low mill's a wonderful place. I, I, 
back up. 28 years old, I'm in the foundry business shoveling 50 tons of sand a day. Sounds like a lot, but it's a pretty small pile. Uh, came down with rheumatoid arthritis, 28. I thought that was an old person disease. <laughs> the kind of kind of crushing thing, but anyhow, I responded well to gold treatments in those days. And uh, at one point, I was being treated at a hospital in Alexandria, Virginia, and I was allowed to go out on a day pass, and I went to this place called the Torpedo Factory in Alexandria. I don't know if anybody's been there, but it was an old torpedo factory that the city had leased to a bunch of artists for a dollar a year. And they, these artists at that point in time, the place was covered in pigeon poop and all kind of stuff, but they had put little chain link barriers between each other and they were painting and trying to sell their art. Eventually they gentrified the whole downtown part of uh, Alexandria. But anyhow, I went there when it was primitive and just loved it, loved the artist. And so just went in the back of my brain. And then after I sold my company, uh, I had the opportunity to buy an old cotton mill here in town, the old low mill, and so I always wanted to kind of do that in the arts, so I, I, I uh, started in effect that, um, the same modeled after the torpedo factory, which I'm, I'm proud to say we're bigger than the torpedo factory now. <laughs> in fact, we're the, we're the biggest private arts facility like that in the world. It's, it's really quite impressive, and if you guys don't get over there, get over there. We have a great coffee shop over there, too. They, so that's a long answer. Let me, I don't think I quite finished it. Downtown was my, my wife's project, uh, Susie. Uh, so the, she, Susie passed away about 10 years ago with lung cancer. Um, when I sold the company, and I, I'm going to just tell this story. I guess it's kind of private. But anyway, when I sold the company, that's a lot of money. I had no idea what to do with that kind of money. We got $90 million. Crazy amount of money. So we split it in thirds. I took a third, she took a third, and we lived off a third. I thought that was pretty cool. She did whatever she wanted to with her third. I did whatever I wanted to with my third. I lost all mine. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. but. <laughs> I, I used mine to invest in every good little startup idea I could think of, and you know how it is, 10% of them were good. One was Shearwater Polymers, though, so that was a, a really great success. Anyhow, Susie was the one who really wanted to do something for downtown. She had been the mayor's assistant under Joe Davis, and uh, so she bought the old Twickenham, uh, old Terry Hutchins building, converted into condos. She bought the corner down there, which we used to be Bubba's, and put in Humphreys, and uh, the Chop House is what we called it. Five Points, star, Starfish, and uh, oh, Asazio. Um, so it, but she was doing that because all of her children left town. You know, and she, we wanted our kids to come back to Huntsville. There wasn't anything here to, to attract a 30-year-old. So we really, want, we really wanted a place they could hear live music seven days a week that sold, you could sing and dance and so forth. And that, like I say, that was Susie's driving thing. Okay, I saw a question back here. Threw out there in STEM talks and added the M to it for medical. There's a robotic center in uh, over Tanner area, or Decatur area. Right. Have you considered, uh, you're talking about educational outreach, have you considered setting up like a schoolhouse for uh, training uh, people in that in your genome area, uh, similar to what they're doing with the robotics center. Um, yes and no. We do train a lot. Uh, we helped Calhoun set up their. They have a biotechnician program where for get a two-year associate's degree and learn how to work in a biotech lab. And so we helped them set that up. We don't, we're not, uh, you know, we're not really a part of it. But we, we teach a lot of courses here. We have internships through the summer and things, but we haven't thought about setting up a, an actual school. I know that I've been to the robotics facility, though. Just a really it's great, that, it really, it some, another thing. It brings in uh, industry right. to the area. All right, another thing that Alabama needs to be really proud of. Yeah, re really great. Yes. <laughs> yeah, isn't that interesting? 
I, you know, I'm a little bitty guy. My dad's trying to make a lump, cast aluminum flower pots in the backyard with a homemade furnace from elect Electrolux vacuum cleaner, <laughs> me melting down aluminum scrap that he bought from the junkyard because he thought aluminum flower pots wouldn't break. And we're talking about the little bitty clay flower pots that florists use because his dad was a florist. Um, and so uh, I watched him do that. I don't know if I learned any lessons from it other than it didn't work. <laughs> My, my dad and I suffer from the same disease. We can't sell anything. So we, he, he was a veteran of World War II, served in the Pacific, was on an LST just off the coast of Japan, set a uh, stage to invade Japan when we dropped the bomb. So I'm sure my dad wouldn't be alive if it hadn't been for the bomb. So I'm pro-bomb, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, uh, he was going to be one of the first ships ashore. Um, he was unemployed after, the, you know, after the World War II. There was a big, pretty big recession, and so he was unemployed through that period. And he, that's when he tried all these things. He tried to sell storm windows for Southern Sash. Um, worked for him for a year, never sold one window. So he decided he couldn't sell. He wanted to manufacture, so he did the flower pots. He had a system for uh, electroplating iron that was actually very exciting to me. And we tried, when I got in graduate school, I tried to duplicate what he was trying to do. Um, I think if I learned anything from him is, my dad was completely open-minded about what it was he was gonna do. He wasn't, you know, I'm gonna do this. So like I say, aluminum flower pots, electroplating iron for the foundry industry. Um, what's, what was another, uh, he, if you go out to the air, airport, if you may have noticed some aluminum airplane hangers out there, they're tea hangers. My dad built those. Uh, he got this idea and design for building uh, airplane hangers. The city wanted him to guarantee they'd last 20 years. That's been 64 years, I think, <laughs> they, they've been out there. And they'll still be worth, when they scrap them, they'll be worth more than they paid for them. But, but any, anyway, yes? Hey, what was your um, biggest challenge in your life journey and how did you overcome it? My life's been pretty damn well blessed. <laughs> it, it, it is crazy. Um, Vietnam was a big challenge. Um, psychologically, uh, I, I, I'm not going to go into that, but that was that was pretty emotional experience. Um, the foundry was I was constantly wanting to be the mad scientist, but here I am making things in the foundry. So that was. Um, I, I really enjoyed the foundry work, but it wasn't what I wanted to do the rest of my life. So um, I was fortunate enough to be able to change. I, I really, I haven't faced many challenges. I'm kind of a weakling. They, I really haven't been challenged much. It, this place, uh, I shouldn't say that. I'm challenged here. I, I'm sure there's some rich people in the room. I need money for our endowment. <laughs> <laughs> That's my biggest challenge, is getting the endowment for Hudson Alpha big enough that it can sustain itself through periods of craziness when people want to slash the NIH budget or something like that. So at the moment, that's my biggest challenge for sure. And yes? Have you ever been in a factory by Franklin in Franklin, Tennessee? I have, yes. Did it inspire you any? Uh, I, actually, I had already bought the mill, low mill, and was looking at designs and went up to the factory at Franklin. Yes. Yeah. So he said he met you. Yes, he I did. Yeah. I went up to his office. Yeah. And I talked to him and his wife for like three hours. Yeah. And yeah. he lives upstairs. And yeah. And happened. really, yeah. yeah. So we, yeah, he had not developed but about a third of what's there now mm -hmm. at that point in time. But yeah, he and I sh shared some ideas oh, about that. Good. Yeah. I wanted to do all arts, and as you know, that's more commercial, sp yeah. more shopping center kind of space. I was wondering if this building that you said uh, Mark Smith is able to bring in under 230 a uh, square foot. Right. Um, does this have the full, you know, hooding, 
Absolutely. Water, that, sewer, you know, it, air and Yes. I will tell you a story about Mark. He was, he stood at the board meeting and said, I swear I'll bring this building in for $150 a square foot. He, and if you, any of you have been to Adtran, $83 a square foot is what, what, it, what it costs for Adtran. So anyway, he was just confident he could build a science building for $150 a square foot. You, some of you who are in science, and it sounds like you are, know that there are certain requirements in a building like this that you just can't get around or you can't economize on. So every, all, we have lots of labs. I don't know if y'all have all had tours or not, but there are many, many labs. And when the air goes into a lab, it has to be thrown away. So the, underneath us is a plant that makes cold air or conditioned air, heat, hot or cold. Uh, cooling is the hard part. I mean, it, it's a six megawatt service we have here. It takes a tremendous amount of electricity and power to condition air, maintain 72 degrees, and then throw it away. Uh, so yes, we do do all of that. We have all the hoods. We have single pass air in all the labs. Um, and that's the reason it wasn't $150 a square foot. <laughs> This is a very porous building, very open air. Through here, I think that's reflected. In it. Can you speak about the business relationships? My yeah. Understanding you want those nonprofits and all this to go. Over right. And the enterprise is not to have quite as much proprietary shelterness as the defense industry usually requires. Can you speak to all? Uh, yes, I can. The um, so Lani and I really wanted to make the free enterprise system work in research. That's what it amounted to. So we were frustrated by the fact that a typical ac epidemic will do his research, write a paper, and not care whether or not any findings get uh, translated into something. That's probably harsh, but they don't pr push it hard anyway. And we wanted to build a system that was pushing scientists to, to commercialize or at least turn over their inventions to people that could commercialize. So we wanted the scientists and the companies to interact all the time, and the building is really designed that way. So it, you might, um, there are little things in the building that I'm very proud of, that uh, our hallways are seven feet wide. So you can walk next to somebody. You don't have to walk behind somebody when you're going down the hallway. You can actually talk. Every so often in a hallway is a whiteboard where you can inset so that you can stop and write. There are markers there if you, if you see somebody you want to talk about. <coughs> Everyone has to come in and out through the, or down the stairwell, down the elevator, and out the one door, set of doors, and that pathway is through the cafe, and all of that's on purpose. Uh, all the other exits, which are required by fire code, are, are alarmed. You're not allowed to go out anyway except that way. So everybody comes to the middle, if you meet somebody at the elevator, you want to talk to them, there are chairs there where you can sit down on the bridge and talk. Um, the cafe, of course, as I say, you got to walk past people it, when you can shout at somebody. The, I'm, there's probably a lot of other things I'm not thinking about, but we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to cause interactions, encourage interactions between the nonprofit and the for-profit. The offices of the uh, investigators, the faculty members, whatever you want to call them, you, you may notice as you look out, there, there are these offices that project out into the atrium and they're glass. And so if I'm one of them, I can sit and look across the atrium, which is nice and has a pretty view, but I'm also looking at offices across the atrium for me, which are the CEOs of the, for, of the companies. So I can look over there and see if so-and-so is available and call them on the phone. Uh, I love it when they don't answer it. <laughs> they, uh, the, the, yeah, but we, and in the beginning, that's exactly the way it was. Now that we have 35 companies, of course, all CEOs aren't, don't get the view of the atrium, but, but the first 10 or 12 did. Yeah. Yes. I'm fascinated with the, the story about the 22 employees. Right. And
adaptation of corporate culture, but how is that maintained when you've got 35 different competitors? I'd like to say it's, yeah, that's an, that, that is a challenge. Um, people tend to stay to themselves, and so it, encouraging events where people get together, interact, the physical building on day-to-day -day moments, it, it encourages that. But we don't um, do a good enough job. That's, that makes it sound like we aren't trying to. And it's hard to get the companies and the researchers to sit here and just brainstorm. Carter does a great job of organizing once a month. We have a, a meeting where all the companies are invited and all the researchers are invited to, to sit around and talk about what they're working on. Um, the attendance is not what I'd like it to be for those events. Um, we serving alcohol. I mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. We are, we, you know, th this is an issue. Yeah. <laughs> When I designed the place, there's a, an executive lounge down here, and it has a kegelator in it. Um, you, you can imagine our attorneys started saying, oh, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. Along that line, sir, uh, Redstone Arsenal has like uh, what they call organization days, where they all go out, have a day of fun and games and so forth. My grandfather worked for uh, the Yellow Pages back in the days when they had the Yellow Pages. Uh, and they did the same thing, uh, mm -hmm. gigantic uh, activity where everybody came together and was able to interact along what she's talking about. Yeah. Have you consider doing something like yeah. that? Yeah, so we do, we do something like that with the faculty. We haven't done something like that with all the CEOs and faculty. We should, we should do that. In fact, it's just two weeks ago, I'm not going to tell any part of the story other than I was in a room, people were discussing culture, why can't we get these people to get along, and I said they just need to go to camp. <laughs> <laughs> they all need to go to a one-week camp where they have to, I mean, I don't mean a t camping, not a camp, camping, dig, dig a trench, pitch, you know, pull together, in fact, and I think those kinds of things are really great. So we actually have been, just this last week, kicking around some ideas like that. The 22 thing is just, it's just a point that you're gonna all experience if you haven't. It get, companies grow and then all of a sudden personnel issues dominate everything. Mm -hmm. Boy, if anybody's got a solution to that, I'd like to find it, yeah. Yes? Yes, um, this is my understanding that your organization is about to assist small businesses to grow. Am I correct in my we, assumption? Uh, is it a kind of business incubator, am I correct? Yeah, a little bit, yes. Okay, so do we have a successful stories out of your Hudson Alpha Institute, like you, you help some business to stand yeah. up, grow, yes. gain some investment, and become a reliable company? Yes. So. As I said, five startups around town moved into the building. They were all reasonably small when they moved in here. Uh, four of those five have gone on to transact for a total of about $200 million. Um, we've got 35 companies in the building now. Uh, and as far as raising money is concerned, yeah, I've got a feeling for how much money's been raised. $150 million, I would say, have been raised by companies uh, from angels and just the, the local network. We don't have the support of the VC community that we would like. On the other hand, I don't like VCs, so maybe that's the, <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's the reason they don't support us. <laughs> David? The physical building we're talking about here, which is wonderful, how do you project this building onto your expansion? Yeah, so that, thank, you, thank you for asking that. You may have noticed, we're 152 acres, so it's a big facility. It's a long stretch of land. The McMillan Park runs right down the center of it. If you haven't walked the park, you should. It has the world's largest double helix. You have one pathway concrete, one pathway gravel, so that you can tell which strand you're walking on. Um, so we have the Jackson Center across the street for our 
our conferences. That's actually a privately owned facility. We have a Building 701 uh, behind us here, which we just were growing so fast we had to have space for the companies, so that was built for company expansion. And now we have a building under construction that is going to be sort of the little sister of this building. It's going to look exactly the same, but only be two stories tall. Atrium will be just a little bit smaller, but it'll it'll look just like this building. And I hope we can continue. Well, I'm determined that we will continue to build quality buildings down the path. Our next building will probably be a nice building with a pretty uh, you know nice looking building, but it'll probably be a greenhouse uh, facility behind it. I've been trying to figure out how to build attractive greenhouses. Um, and you can build attractive greenhouses, but they go from $40 a square foot to $200 a square foot, so that's not nice. Yes? How much money do you think you need to raise for the foundation? And $250 million. Okay, follow-up <laughs> question. Since you have mentioned your rotten sales, what's your strategy? <laughs> Hire other people to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, um, I, I, I sense I'm being hooked. Uh, yeah, so this is a good group, and I'll be honest, it's not what I expected. I thought this would be a lot of younger people. I'm sorry, you're not really old. I, I'm the oldest person in the room, I'll promise that. 75, I'll challenge you. They, they, 74 next month. All right, see, I told you, I win. Um, <laughs> But I, you know, it's, it's a good feeling group. I love the energy, uh, and, and I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. 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 Thank you.